Okay, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. My name is Ricky Burdett. I'm the director of LSC Cities, and together with my colleagues John Hills and Power of CASE, the Center for the Analysis of Social Exclusion, we welcome you <coughs> to this joint event that we're um, very happy to host because we're hosting not just a distinguished uh, uh, specialist in the field of cities, but a very, very close friend. Um, and that's a rare thing to be able to do, that to actually have someone who's a colleague, a friend, and as passionate about cities, I think, uh, as certainly I am, but even as passionate about cities as Anne Power is, and we'll hear more about that um, later today. Uh, Bruce is here to uh, flog a book, this. So you've got to buy it. You've got to go outside at the end of this, uh, and uh, if you don't buy, you've got to download the app, see the video, uh, and uh, everything else. Bruce has been on a whirlwind tour around the world um, uh, talking about this. Many American cities or internationally last night. There were a few um, individuals who were rather interested in hearing what he had to say, including, what was his name? Oh, Tony Blair, yes, yeah. And uh, a few others at uh, JP Morgan, the event on global cities. So Bruce is really trying to push uh, we'll hear uh, this in a moment, a very strong and a very important message for all of us interested in the health and the wealth uh, of cities. Uh, just a word about Bruce and the structure of the evening. He will be talking for around 25, 30 minutes or so, and Bruce, I'm going to tell you now, speak slowly, right? It's fine. You don't have to. <laughs> this is not an American audience. Uh, you know, we, we're here for the evening. We're here with you, so speak slowly. He can speak so fast as you don't know what's going on. Um, Anne, and I'll talk about her work in a moment, why it resonates so much tonight. Anne Power will then uh, respond for 10 minutes or so on how Bruce's work, which is focused very much on, on the American city and the economy in the American city, uh, resonates with many of the issues that she's been involved in and studying in UK cities and the European city context. Uh, we will then have a discussion, uh, the three of us, and open up for questions to the floor, and uh, we will leave some time at the end for Bruce to sign books outside. So please, if you're uh, so inclined, do have a look at the book and get it signed by him, which is a wonderful thing. Uh, Bruce is co-author with this book uh, with Jennifer uh, Bradley, uh, and it's one of the many, many publications that he's done over the years at the Metropolitan Policy Program at the Brookings Institution. Brookings is probably the prime uh, research and policy, public policy institution in the United States. It's influenced uh, government thinking for many years on a whole series of issues from defense to the economy and because of Bruce on cities. In fact, not on cities, but on metros. Uh, I learned this word, I don't know what it was. I thought it was a newspaper that you got on the tube, uh, or it was a shopping center, or something like that, or it was what the French cutely called the underground system, but we don't, really the word metros in English doesn't resonate. And when we uh, organized a conference together, and, and I said, well, we should call it, I run something called the Urban Age uh, with colleagues, call it the Urban Summit. He said, no, no, Urban sounds really bad in America. It sounds sort of poor and negative. You know, metros is the word. And it's very interesting how, you know, when we talk about uh, nations sort of separated uh, by a language, by a common language, how even these words, which matter so much, cities, urban, metro, all mean something else quite different. And the fact that he's called the book The Metropolitan Revolution is very important in the context of American uh, policy at the moment, partly because one of the key arguments is that it's been forgotten. That the, the, the role of cities in regenerating uh, the economy has not been as prominent. And uh, as you will hear, he will argue, um, this is one of the things that needs to be put back. And he will do that very forcefully in a moment. Uh, Bruce has uh, trained as a lawyer and uh, worked uh, for a number of years in government. He was uh, a key player under the Bill Clinton administration with Henry his Cisneros, who was one of the really great heads of the Secretary of State for the Housing and Urban Development at a time that uh, the United States was heavily investing in cities and in housing uh, and many other important initiatives. Uh, he didn't let go, even though there was a long period in which the Democrats weren't in power um, and uh, returned very much to influence the thinking that is happening there. We go back, uh, Bruce and I, because of Anne. Uh, we met through Anne Power. In fact, um, 
I remember the first time I heard Bruce speak, it was at the centenary event for the Joseph Roundtree Foundation, where, Anne, you invited me. He's come and hear this guy talk about neighborhoods in America and all that. And it was you and a guy called Gordon Brown. And I have to say, no one remembers what Gordon Brown said. Everyone remembers what you said, because it was so powerful and actually quite shocking what was going on in terms of inequality, particularly inequality of young people in the American city. From then, we started a conversation which continues. It's a three-way conversation uh, with Anne and Case and, and, and John's work uh, about how to deal with sort of fundamental issues of uh, urban change. I think one of the things it's fair to say is that because you're a lawyer, you're someone interested in governance and the economy of cities, uh, LSE cities, the urban age has been much more involved over the years in studying sort of spatial dimensions, infrastructure, even the design and the environment of cities and how that uh, works in terms of these issues of inequality uh, and potential cohesion, that it's been a two-way learning curve. I've learned an enormous amount about governance and, um, and um, the economy, and I hope we've influenced a little bit uh, some of the uh, work uh, that has been done by Brookings. If at nothing else, at the level of the staggering graphics that uh, Bruce now uses, which are even better than the LSE Cities ones, which we were so proud about. Um, so it's a long and important collaboration which will continue, and it continues very much also through Anne's presence. In fact, they go back further then we go back, and it's an important link, actually, because the last time, Anne, in a way that cities were at the center of the sort of national political stage were just, uh, was just after Tony Blair had been elected in the 97 uh, late New Labour government. John Prescott was then the Minister for the Environment, and he asked a group of people under Richard Rogers to look at cities known as the Urban Task Force. Anne was a member, so was I. Um, and just after that, I think, uh, beginning of 2000, 2001, uh, John Prescott organized an event in Manchester, which was the Big Cities Summit. And Bruce was one of the speakers there, and the collaboration continued on a whole series of initiatives, um, which has led really to the work that Anne has done on city reformers, looking at other cities in Europe, Phoenix cities. There's been that collaboration sort of on both sides of, of uh, the Atlantic. Um, Anne is extremely well known to everyone here at the LSE and just probably very well known to everyone here in the room, simply because she has been and continues to be the voice uh, of conscience for those who are left behind in cities in the UK in all the work that she's done, housing t uh, people at the bottom end of the scale, how to help um, policymakers who have good ideas really rethink their uh, policies which uh, address these key issues of integrated housing and cohesion, and has done this by looking at cities which seemed to be completely dead, like Belfast or Bilbao or others, and have actually resurged through, by design, by political design, and, and not just by default, so to speak. So I think that's an incredibly powerful um, uh, body of work that has been done. Uh, she puts her money where her mouth is. She's very involved in the National Tenants uh, Resource Center, which represents hundreds of thousands of tenants across social housing, public housing in, in the UK. So there are very important uh, dialogue is going to happen once we hear Bruce talk about the American situation and Anne then say, how does this resonate over here? So um, that's the structure of the evening, 20 minute or so presentation. Fantastic that Case and LSE Cities are collaborating again for this event. And can you please join me in welcoming Bruce Katz. Um, so first of all, uh, thank you to Ricky, uh, LSE Cities. Uh, Anne, John Hills is here. Um, so I was a general course student at the London School of Economics about 100 years ago. Um, and uh, the, when Anne invited me to come here back, I think, about 2002, um, it was really, for, for me, sort of a homecoming. Uh, for, if there are Americans in the audience who are general course students or master's students, um, I, I think you know what a profound impact this place uh, is having on your lives. So. Um, you know, I went home after a year at the London School of Economics and didn't come back to London. And it actually was, it was at just the beginning of the Thatcher um, regime 
though I remember it more as the clash and the police and whatever was else was going on. And I, it was just a remarkable place to be because as an American where we are so quintessentially optimistic, um, or maybe I'm just quintessentially optimistic, uh, to be in Britain in 79 and 80 in the middle of some really profound unrest, socially, culturally, economically, um, at this place, which was so fundamentally diverse internationally compared to American universities at the time. You know, it just had a real profound effect on my life. So to come back here um, 10 years ago and begin to engage uh, with the faculty and the students and then to do what R Ricky just said, which is not really to impart knowledge, but, but to have this incredible two-way dialogue. Um, you know, Anne, Ricky, John, others, Tony Travers, profound influence on what Brookings has done over the past uh, 15 years, essentially. Um, and what you see here, uh, the culmination of this book, um, really uh, sort of, I think, uh, includes and incorporates that influence. I mean, there are things that we talk about, that we write about, that we advocate for, that frankly, I learned here. Um, because no one in the United States was talking about these issues before. So I just wanted uh, to say at the beginning, um, it is wonderful to be here um, with friends, and it's wonderful to be here uh, with people who have had such an influence on, on sort of my intellectual evolution. Um, now let's get to the sound and light show, right? Um, so this book is really about a pivotal decade in the United States. Um, and, it, and it really starts uh, with the aftermath of the Great Recession, uh, which continues, even though the recession has been officially over for some period of time. You know, there's a reason why recessions get called great. You know, we, we still have to make up, grow about 8.3 million jobs to make up the jobs we lost during the downturn and to keep pace with population and labor dynamics, because as you all know, the United States continues to be a growing nation. And we tend to grow by about 30 million people a decade. Uh, but more importantly, we need to grow better jobs because we have seen a rise in poverty and near poverty that we have really not seen in the past half century, from 81 million in 2000 to 107 million in 2011. That's a quantum leap in one short decade that is the response, uh, that is the culmination of the recession, but also, frankly, uh, the manufacturing collapse that occurred in the early part of the last decade. So to respond to uh, these challenges of such magnitude, you have to do something small, right? You have to basically restructure your economy to one, from one that was characterized pre-recession by consumption and debt and home building on steroids, right? And financial engineering and mischief uh, to one that is fueled by innovation, not just idea generation, but production and innovation and technology-led growth, one that is powered by low carbon uh, and the shift to a sustainable growth model, one that is driven by exports and foreign direct investment and global engagement and immigration. That is a completely different growth model for the United States, which for a long time had convinced themselves, both parties, that somehow we were on the path to a post-industrial economy where we would just generate the brilliant ideas in Silicon Valley and the Chinese would produce everything, right? So this is a fundamental shift. And if you're going to make a restructuring of this order, it would be nice to have a national government that could act with vision and deliberate deliberation and with purpose. We have a minor problem in the United States. Uh, the federal government, like Elvis, has left the building. And it is not clear, and frankly, a couple weeks ago, they literally had left the building, right? And it was not clear if they were coming back anytime soon, right? Um, but we have a government at the national level that is mired in partisan gridlock and ideological polarization and doesn't seem capable of doing even the basic stuff that central governments and federal governments have to do. But this is not just a cyclical issue. This is a structural issue. Because over the next decade, what our national government does 
is about to change irreparably because of the aging of our society. And we all knew this was coming, and everyone's written about it for 25 years, but it's here because the baby boomers are retiring. And so what we're about to see is a shift of federal spending uh, to the so-called mandatory spending items, which is another cute way of saying the social safety net, right? Uh, income security, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, our health care system, uh, and Social Security, our retirement system. And what that's going to do is going to squeeze down and crowd out the spending that the federal government does on some minor things like defense and research and development, basic science, where the federal government actually is the dominant player, and infrastructure, and housing, and education, and skills. So in a relatively short period of time, we're going to see just health care and retirement benefits uh, go from around 42% of the budget to about 52% of the budget. Um, I like to say that in the next decade, the, the federal government is essentially going to become a health insurance company and an army. Um, and, you know, what is happening here is there is a de facto signal being sent to everyone else in the country, not just government, city governments, suburban governments, and state governments, but really the whole civil society, the big society, so to speak, corporate, civic, philanthropic, university, labor, environmental, all the constituencies, the networks that basically co-produce the American economy and co-govern our society. The memo is out. You now run the country. You now need to make the principal transformative investments in what drives our economy and what makes us a more inclusive and sustainable society, the federal government is essentially um, going to do much, much less. That leads us to the Metropolitan Revolution. And the Metropolitan Revolution basically says, and this is really trying to chronicle uh, the best action and affirmative energy and pragmatic action that is happening in the country, that cities and metropolitan areas, not just governments, but networks of institutions and leaders are stepping up and doing the hard work to make their communities more prosperous and to restructure the economy to grow jobs. Now, they're doing that because they can. There are 388 metropolitan areas in the United States, and these are the commuter sheds, the labor markets, the housing markets, the cities and suburbs together, right? 388 total. We look at the top 100, which is about a quarter of all of them. Uh, they sit on one-eighth of the land mass, they're two-thirds of our population, they're three-quarters of our GDP, and on every single indicator that matters to a modern, sophisticated economy, whether it's skilled workers, whether it's infrastructure to move people, goods, energy, services, and ideas, or whether it's innovation, however we measure innovation, patent intensity, advanced industry, they are 75, 80, 85, 90% of the national share. So there is no American economy. We are powerful because we are networks of cities and metropolitan economies. And essentially, what we need now uh, is to build from um, these powerful economic engines. So our book tells a series of stories of cities and metropolitan areas stepping up. We start with Denver and Los Angeles which are cities that are using local resources, not federal for the most part, but local resources to invest in modern state-of-the-art transit. Just not to move people through their congested metropolitan areas, but to send a signal to the world, we will be a sustainable metropolis, because in that way we'll attract innovative firms and talented workers. In Northeast Ohio, what we have is a group of philanthropy and business and this is going back a decade, so this was prescient, uh, helping small and medium-sized manufacturing firms toughen up their business plans, retool their facilities, retrain their workers, and, and have products that are competitive on the global market. Betting on production, because the understanding that manufacturing is not a dirty old industry, but is one of the most technologically sophisticated industry. In New York City, in the depths of the recession after the Lehman collapse, Mayor Bloomberg and hundreds of corporate, civic, and university leaders crowdsourcing the idea 
of let's attract a world-beating engineering R&D technology university to New York City because we don't have one, right? We don't have a Carnegie Mellon, we don't have a Georgia Tech, we don't have an MIT, we don't have a Stanford. And they ultimately get Cornell and Technion to unmoor themselves and come to Roosevelt Island. Eight years ago, if you asked Mayor Bloomberg, what is your major economic development intervention, he would have said, we're about to subsidize two stadia on the west side of Manhattan because we're competing with London for the 2012 Olympics. Fast forward to today, and New York City is setting an institutional platform for innovation. Houston, one of the most demographically diverse cities in the United States, building a network of 21st century settlement houses to integrate thousands, tens of thousands of immigrants into the economic mainstream, to be productive citizens and entrepreneurs and productive workers with access to low-cost banking, English as a second language, skills training, education. Portland, and I'll come back to Portland. You know, there's a, there's a show in the United States called Portlandia, just to basically show how weird and crunchy this place is. It's like, you know, the hippies didn't leave the United States. They just moved to Portland, right? But this is an export powerhouse. So in a minute, I'll sort of take you through the Portland story about how a city uh, basically designs and delivers its own trade strategy, its own foreign policy, and even Detroit. So we all know about you know, the horrors of Detroit, the fiscal challenges, the serious social challenges. But if you go to Detroit today, it's 138 square miles. You don't go to the full city. Just go to the core of the city. About seven square miles, 3% of the land mass, 40% of the jobs, that's where Detroit will revive. The downtown, the riverfront, Canada sits to the south, the old Woodward Corridor that will now be occupied by transit to the midtown area with all the anchors, the eds and the meds and small batch manufacturing. It is beginning to revive, not because of government, because there is no government in Detroit, but because of networks of corporate, civic, university institutions that are basically betting billions of dollars that they can help this once great city come back from its core. So those are the stories we tell in the book. We tell a couple other stories. We could have told 25 others. Because in the end, the United States is not dependent on the health and vitality or the actions of 537 elected officials in Washington, DC. We are a country of 350 million, and we are strong, and we are resilient because of the networks of leaders that, again, co-produce our economy and co-govern our communities. Let's go to Portlandia, or, well, Portland. Um, and let's just start by telling a story of how Portland thinks about the world evolving, not as a network of nations, but as a network of trading cities. Listen to this. The foundation of cities has always been trade. 2,000 years ago, the Silk Road linked cities from China to the Roman Empire. The world is now being remade as a network of globalizing metros that trade together based on distinctive clusters of firms, specialized expertise, and cultural affinity. San Jose, Bangalore, and Seoul are technology hubs. Portland, Copenhagen, and Curitiba focus on green industry. Detroit, Stuttgart, Monterey, and Nagoya are linked by manufacturing. Metros that connect by trade grow and prosper together. So get a passport, find your trading partners, travel the new Silk Road. Um, that was done by a London firm, by the way. So I think in Tech City, so you yeah. know. Um, so let's talk a little about Portland and what Portland was thinking about. Uh, w when the recession hit, Portland had double digit unemployment, right, 12% or so. I mean, it was the hardest hit of the western cities and the western metros. So it began to think, well, what do we do to dig out of this hole? And so it looked inside, looked at its assets, its attributes and advantages, and besides being weird and crunchy, it found that we are an export powerhouse, right? The, the export intensity of our metropolis is much greater than other metropolitan areas in the United States. And particularly, we are really good at making environmental sustainable products and sustainable services 
Because 40 years ago, when we think about Portland, what did they do? They had an urban growth boundary. They tore down a freeway. They put a transit in the downtown, right? They were sustainable before sustainable was cool. And what that did is it attracted a whole bunch of firms that said, hey, let's go to this. Hey, we're not going to go to Copenhagen, right? We're going to go, we're going to stay in the United States. Where do we go? We go to Portland. And that's what's been happening. Hundreds of firms basically making these products and services. Well, guess what? You wake up 40 years later, you see cities rising in China with air you can't breathe. You see cities rising in India with water you can't drink. That is a market, right, for smart goods and smart services. You can do good, you can do well. That's the Portland story. Let's listen to them talk about it. Sustainability is, um, as, an, as an emerging industry, the sustainable technology and sustainable services industries is a little abstract for some people, and we saw that as a competitive advantage. We know how to build cities. We have companies that do the architectural services, the clean technology, the green roofs, and all the things that go into making a green city. And don't you want your city to be a little bit like this as well? What it is that Portland has to offer, and as most of the rest of the world continues to urbanize at a drastically faster pace, we think we have a package of services and goods that are going to be incredibly valuable to those uh, economies all around the world. So there's two kinds of green in the world, right? There's the green so we don't toast the planet, and there's the green where people doing the right thing can make money, good jobs, clean tech, production, innovation, export oriented. That's what Portland is doing. So these are the stories. We're sticking by them. Um, these are stories of crowdsourcing and crowdfunding, right? Yes, there are public leaders in these stories. Occasionally, there are charismatic leaders in these stories. But what we call this is the post-hero economy, because this is mostly about networks of institutions and leaders stepping up and realizing that they are on their own. The cavalry is not coming. If Washington does something smarter, strategic, today, it's probably an accident, right? And if their states are in the service of their growth or prosperity, well, you can't depend on that because governors come and go. So networks, not governments, cities and metros are networks. Networks are beginning to stand up and to collaborate to compete, in the words of Governor John Hickenlooper of Colorado, former mayor. So how do you start a revolution, right? This is not Che, right? We're not going into the hills. Um, this is basically on the ground in cities and metros of the United States. Well, first, you create a network. I mean, you, you, you really focus on, given the particular issue that you might have to wrestle with or opportunity to leverage, you focus on who needs to be in the room, right, who can work together. Because when you think of all these constituencies, public and private and civic and philanthropic and university and health and labor and all the rest of them. Each one of them can do things by themselves off their own balance sheets or off their own creativity. But when they come together, they can do grand things. So there are different ways to form a network and different ways to steward a network. In New York City, what really happened here was a crowdsourcing exercise. It's not like Bloomberg woke up on a Tuesday and said, hey, you know, we got to get Cornell and Technion to New York, right? He, he went out and his team went out, dozens of meetings, hundreds of leaders. What is going to diversify our economy uh, so that we have a platform uh, to build the sort of prosperity we need? In Northeast Ohio, very different sort of process. Again, a lot of crowdsourcing, primarily from the philanthropies, but the creation of what I would consider to be 21st century institutions and intermediaries, fund for our economic future, a whole set of cluster intermediaries. Um, when you think about Cleveland, you have small and medium-sized manufacturing. You also have the Cleveland Clinic. You have the Case Western Reserve. So you have all this life sciences, right, that if you're smart off a manufacturing base can lead to bioengineering. So that's what they've been doing with a cluster and a network of in institutions and intermediaries. In Detroit, it's actually just a loose affiliation of millionaires and billionaires, right? There's no like shingle in Detroit. There's no one stop in Detroit of a, of a network, uh, but a series of networks of corporate civic and university intermediaries in the absence, literally, of any government. 
Once you have a network, you can set a vision. So in the, in the consumption economy, we began to think that urban and metropolitan economies were ubiquitous, right? There's no difference between a Walmart in Phoenix or one in Pittsburgh or a housing subdivision outside Detroit or outside Denver, right? Same price, same design, same footprint, uh, particularly on the Walmart side, that's why they're so profitable. In the traded economy, in the productive economy, in the innovative economy, what makes Phoenix special on the global stage is fundamentally different from what makes Pittsburgh special or Portland, and same with Denver and Detroit. So what's happening in the, in the post-recession economy, again, in the absence of any national leadership, is that folks are following the advice of the great American philosopher in the 20th century, Dolly Parton. You know, find out who you are and do it on purpose. And so when you look at these stories, what's happening? In New York, again, it's almost a negative story because they're saying to themselves, we're too dependent on financial services. We could have an interesting conversation about London, I suppose. Um, and we don't have enough STEM in our system. Science, technology, engineering, and math, which is about 20 percent of, of, of the U.S. economy by certain measures, but obviously dominates the San Jose economy. Portland again looked inside and said, hey, we're an export powerhouse, and we're a clean economy powerhouse. You put those two together, you got a brilliant combination. And Detroit again said, we can't look at all 138 square miles. Let's just look at the little bit in the core, 3 percent of the land mass, 40 percent of the jobs, uh, and incredible bones to build on. And talk about the clean economy, the whole place in the core of Detroit is powered by waste to energy. It's like the Swedish model brought to Detroit. Final part, find your game changer. I would guarantee that if you go to any American metropolis and you say to them, in the past 50 years, was there one intervention that really set you on a different trajectory? Could have been an infrastructure investment. It could have been an advanced research institution basically locating to your metropolis, or maybe Bill Gates decided to come home. I mean, you know, it could be any number of things, right? But something that changed your trajectory, changed your economic profile, and ultimately changed your performance, that's what we're saying to American cities and metros they need to think about. All three of these stories <coughs> are about innovation. New York City is about institutional platform for innovation. Because again, if you don't have one of these world-beating engineering, R&D, tech-driven universities, um, we could talk about the innovative economy. But it's highly unlikely, highly unlikely, that the kind of commercialization of innovation you're going to have in your city is going to be manufacturing-driven or is going to be the synergistic effect of various clusters coming together. You need these institutions to be in the core of the city. In Northeast Ohio, it is about manufacturing. Cars are technology on computers, on wheels, right? Aerospace. I mean, to think that manufacturing is an old industry is absurd, particularly given the wages and the benefits that many manufacturing firms pay. And finally, Detroit is understanding that in this century, or at least the first quarter or half of this century, the spatial geography of innovation is going to shift. It's not go to the downtown, get in a car, drive 30 miles out to the Research Triangle Park, go into a closed corporate campus that is protecting their secrets, right? Eat lunch in the cafeteria in the basement, do nothing in the science park because there's no walkways, bikeways, transit. There's no housing, there are no amenities, there's no retail, and you get back in your car at the end of the night and drive 40 miles to your house. That geography of innovation is shifting in the United States. It's coming back into the cores. It's coming back into the downtowns. It's coming back into the midtowns with the anchors, the eds, and the meds. Detroit gets that, and they understand because of demographic preferences, the millennials wanting walkability, livability, bikeability, connectivity, but also firms wanting open innovation to have the bump and mingle effect of coming out of your company, right, working on X, Y, or Z, and having a random conversation in a coffee shop down the street 
right? That's the kind of innovation that we see in cities. That's the kind of innovation we see in the 21st century in sector after sector after sector. So what we're doing at Brookings, you know, sort of, I mean, again, this is your typical U.S. either delusionary action right, or just, you know, trying to build from this distributed, right, diffuse power we have in our country is we are going to try to inspire and to inform and to catalyze and coach game-changing initiatives all over our country in the next three or five years while Washington considers, continues to be on a frolic and a detour. Now, if we are successful, I think this is where we end up. From an early age, we are taught how our nation is supposed to work. The president, vice president, and members of Congress sit at the top. Governors and legislators run their states. The rest of us take our cues from them. While states and the federal government may be part of the Constitution, our population and economic power is actually concentrated in our metropolitan areas. It's time to rethink power in America. In this century, metros will lead and states and the federal government will follow. In cities and metros, public, private, and civic leaders are helping workers get the skills they need. Investing in infrastructure and growing jobs through expanded trade and investment, the hard work necessary to renew our economy. So I don't get invited to the White House anymore, but that's fine because in this century, I believe cities and metropolitan areas, already the engines of our economies, already the centers of trade and investment, already on the vanguard of demographic transformation and climate change, they will now be the centers of policy innovation. And they will be the centers of political pragmatism and network governance to drive our countries forward, to drive our economies forward, and to build an inclusive and sustainable society. So this is an urban age. This is a metropolitan century. Uh, buckle your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy ride. Thank you. comments in a moment, but we now have, uh, hello, <laughs> you disappeared down there. Uh, we now have uh, Anne Power, Professor of Social Policy, uh, the founder, in fact, of Housing and Communities uh, Department here within the LSE, who's going to give her response, seen from the UK and a European perspective, and then we'll open it up to the floor. Thank you. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Bruce. Sure. Thank you, Ricky. I met Bruce in 1996 in Washington at a very, very large conference of the federal government. And a friend of mine who's a mutual friend, Richard Barron from St. Louis, one of the really supposed basket cases of cities in America. I don't mean to offend, I think there's a St. Louis student. I thought there. you were talking about Richard, but. Yeah, no, 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 no. Um, yeah, uh, and this friend, Richard Barron, who I'd worked with for 20 years um, on tenant management, whispered to me, I've got to introduce you to Bruce Katz, who was then um, head of staff for the Secretary of State for Housing and Urban Development. He's really depressed, but the one thing he'd really love, which would really help him get out of this depression about the federal government, it was Bruce is only ever depressed about the federal government, as far as I can gather. Um, is if you invite him to LSE. So I don't know how it took us it took a while. six years to do it, but um, in fact, I think it was a bit less. Uh, when we set up the Center for Alternative, for, for the Center for Analysis of Social Exclusion, um, we managed to fix it so that Bruce went from being this big powered um, uh, cities top down type to being a much more, um, I'm really interested in Europe and in social exclusion kind of person. And he became a visiting professor with us. And we're very, very pleased and happy he did. Um, because the exchange has been like a constant standing on an earthquake, really, I suppose. So when Bruce sent me the draft of his book early this summer, because he was coming on a whip through London and we were going to talk about it, 
I was struck by the unbelievable energy and dynamism of the book, and I was incredibly pleased by the examples you chose for the book. Very American, but actually with strong resonance of all the discussions <coughs> and all the work that we'd done together comparing Europe and America. <coughs> there are some fascinating case studies, but for me the most unlikely ones were the Houston one where my sister lived and where she was 80 miles in her suburban house in Houston from the center of Houston. Um, Denver, which I know a little bit and which had very, very different from when I was there in the 70s, very strong racial divisions and a whole struggle with the fact that the suburbs were basically causing a lot of problems for the city and how then a collaboration was formed between the city and the suburbs, which I thought was really impressive. And most importantly, Detroit. And I don't know if any of you were at that very famous showing of the terrible film about Detroit here about five years ago, where Detroit was literally an unworthy city and definitely, definitely could not possibly build uh, a transit line because that would be ridiculous in such a basket case city. And there were two young women students at the LSE from Detroit who stood up and told the white film crew from the UK who hadn't been able to get any black people to speak in this film, I don't recognize the Detroit you're talking about, you'll yeah. remember. Right. And that was very, very powerful because I think it's very easy for Europeans to misjudge America. There's a lot that we can judge quickly and see wrong, but then I think that the Americans also misjudge Europe. So here's a few reactions to the book. I think there are some really important ways in which Europe is very different from America, and therefore we're bound to have a different attitude. We're much denser, and therefore our core cities are what we call cities. And Ricky is absolutely right that this idea that you count Houston to 80 miles out just doesn't chime in Europe. We don't have the space. That means that although we've got big problems with suburban sprawl, which is basically what Metro America is about, um, it's much closer in. It's bus rides and it's train rides. Um, and we be have to make much more effort at containment because we are a much denser continent. The UK particularly is a very dense country, level pegging with Holland, at the very top of the World League of dense countries. That does make Europe's urban growth problems much more manageable. And I remember Bruce telling me that transit would, public transit would always be difficult in America because American cities were locked into suburban sprawl and had low-density public transport, high-density freeways and cars, whereas we have the complete opposite. Um, we can't get freeways through our cities, thank God. Um, we also have a much stronger public framework, and that's mainly because of the two world wars that were fought in Europe, and that forced us to completely change our attitude to public provision. After all, armies and the military took over the running of Europe at its most desperate times, between the beginning of the, 20, uh, the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. So, so government, we could not talk about government the way you do. It would be so... Wrong. Um, I hope you'll not end up with your problem of Congress closes down, um, in which case we'll have to talk like you do. Um, but also, Europeans generally like cities. We have this big thing of urban tourism, and people who go on weekend breaks very often go to Manchester and Leipzig, and you know, our weak market cities, our struggling cities, our tourist hubs, Bilbao, big, big, big million tourists a year go to Bilbao. Um, and, and that is a really very different thing. I think the final thing I'd say that's very different in Europe is that we have, we Europeans have, a much stronger focus on neighborhood renewal and neighborhood integration. And that's partly because we're denser. It's partly because of our colonial history, which for whatever reason has made us feel much worse about the way we've treated people around the world, even if we haven't done very well at recovering our ground, whereas for some reason Americans just have this kind of block on that problem, which still seems to be there. So based on that, from Bruce's book and from 
my discussions with him, my heady discussions with him, I think there are a few really big challenges for the US, which are also challenges here, but I think in a slightly more diluted way. The first is the low energy transition in America is very, very difficult because America is so energy dependent, like at least 70% more energy dependent than Europe, which is four times the rate of China and, which is, and so on. Uh, secondly, I think public transport, however hard you try, is much more difficult to make comprehensive and your big standalone houses built at very low density make both public transit and the low energy transition more expensive. So who is going to pay for that to happen? That, that is one of my questions. Secondly, because of your weaker public framework, you didn't have these world wars that um, tore Europe apart. I think you have a weaker public service infrastructure. Um, and because you rely so much on local enterprise and local initiative, which is brilliantly inspiring to us, it does mean that your cities are grossly more unequal than ours. Because if you live in a suburb that's rich, then you have a fantastic service infrastructure. And if you live in a city area that's poor, then the opposite is true. So although we have some of those problems, we have them at a, a more dilute level. Um, you have much higher levels of racial segregation. So I just read a new book about Chicago where the measure of racial segregation in neighborhoods is 75% black or 75% white. Well, that's a level of um, segregation of different ethnic groups that, that is actually quite unusual still in Europe, although we are far too complacent about how serious an issue it is. And then, from my experience, the seriously poor neighborhoods in America are seriously poor. And although we have very poor neighborhoods, I have never, ever anywhere seen anything even remotely comparable here in Europe, anywhere in the most difficult areas to what I've seen in America. So, so I think those are big challenges. On the other hand, Brookings is, as you saw from Bruce, uh, full of solutions. Um, the focus on local capacity and local solutions is, has to be right and has to chime with um, all the work that I've done, certainly, in cities and neighborhoods and pulling in all possible partners, I, I think I could say that we're running behind the game on that one, but we agree with you. Um, secondly, pushing production and manufacture linked to past engineering skills is what's happening and has happened um, in Europe, and Germany is obviously our best example, but all our cities. Laura's just been looking at um, evidence on Sheffield and uh, the growth in uh, advanced manufacturing in a city like Sheffield, which everybody thought was dead and gone. We all remember the full Monty, and there was nothing left of steel. But actually, there was a lot left of steel, but in hidden crannies. And so Boeing relocated its research headquarters worldwide to Sheffield. Rolls-Royce relocated to Sheffield. Those are big ones. There are, well, 99% of all companies in Sheffield are SMEs, just to give you a bit of an idea. Um, so, so that is very important. Thirdly, uh, Brookings' idea that you spot green shoots in unlikely places. I mean, I remember talking to Bruce about Detroit over the whole period of its gradual collapse, if you want to think of the city government failing as collapse, and talking constantly about the green shoots. But when British filmmakers went to Detroit, they were incapable of seeing any I think any green shoots. I don't know if they found any green shoots. So, so I think that's something that Brookings and America is much better at than us. And self-belief generates solutions. That, I think, is evidence from all my work with low-income communities. And human beings are natural problem solvers. So if you have a culture of problem solving, then you're going to solve problems. And so good luck, Bruce, but you'll Great. do it, I'm quite sure. Um, the other thing that I think is really interesting, one of the things that brought Bruce and me together, believe it or not, was that he and Amy Liu, his colleague at Brookings, had just written um, an article on sprawl, and we, the Urban Task Force, had been very exercised about urban renaissance and compact cities and stopping sprawl. And so Bruce was very fascinated by the fact that we were trying to stop the problem that they were trying to solve. And I just think that that philosophy of Bruce's has actually shifted thinking in America across the board, really. 
Abandonment is no longer where the game is at. It's going with the flow. In other words, coming back to cities, which is brilliant. So what can Europe learn from America? And I think we do have to be humble about this. Stronger city leadership is a good thing, although it has landed quite a few mayors in jail. <laughs> so it's not always a good thing. Um, and we do have some very good mayors in Europe. So I think mayors are good, but they're not the only good. And Manchester, where Bruce is going on Friday, has actually created a new form of governance called the Greater Manchester Combined Authority. I'll be very interested to see how clumsy or how smart you find it. It won't be like one of your thrusting mayors, but it is actually achieving a huge amount, so that's one point. Um, secondly, your attitude of being less dependent on central government would not only chime with what the Conservative coalition government is trying to say and do, but it will actually chime with what city leaders here want and say. Um, thirdly, uh, the United States has a much more enterprising culture. We know that it produces more new, new, new everythings. Um, I don't think that's always good, but in general, that go-getting attitude um, is very envy-making. Um, I think one of the most important lessons that we can learn from America is that ghetto formation is a very, very, very bad thing, and that it is very hard to unscramble when once we've allowed it to happen. And although I'm trying to argue, I'm arguing that that hasn't happened here, I think one, there's a risk of it happening, but two, much more importantly, we have in the UK already allowed it to happen in our schools, and I think that is deeply wrong. We have many, many schools in London which are way over 75% white or over 75% minority. And I know that that is bad for us. And we should learn from the American bitter, bitter, bitter experience on that one. Um, fourthly, um, Bruce and his colleagues talk a lot about the Eds and Meds being the big rescue for cities, meaning that higher education and medical institutions actually can form the basis for remaking cities. If you can link that with strong, fast transit, actually all of our European cities, every single one that I've visited, including the very weakest, has that combination already in place. And it just needs to shout about it a bit more mm -hmm. um, because it's, it's working for you and actually it's working for us too. Finally, Europe can't afford obsolete infrastructure. America has cast off infrastructure like there's no tomorrow, which is one of the reasons why European visitors to Detroit get so depressed because they just see so much abandoned infrastructure, including the housing stock, but, but everything. Um, in Europe, we're just too crowded to do that. And I think the fact that America is revaluing its infrastructure is something that we can take. Finally, I just want to ask whether the American federal government is quite as bad as Bruce makes it seem. Um, well, somebody at the back is nodding fiercely. Uh, no, it's yes, but. It's yes, but. It might be really bad. It seems very terrible that sh there should be a seized up government. Actually, Belgium had no government at all for 18 whole months, only a couple of years ago. And our Belgian friend said, God, it's so brilliant not having a government. <laughs> um, that's a slight exaggeration. Um, I think the federal government is still one of those underpinning forces that um, you need and don't disrespect it too much, or you might be sorry you've thrown out the baby <coughs> with the bathwater. Um, secondly, you say that um, cities are not governments, they're networks. Well, cities are both governments and networks. And please remember the lesson of Joseph Chamberlain and Manchester in the 19th century, that businesses could not flourish in cities without the overarching role of government. It was businesses in our cities that created government because they couldn't pull together enough of the elements without there being some kind of consensual framework of law, of tax, of local investment that actually held it together. And that's how our city governments became a bit overpowered, but 
if they're underpowered, they're not very good either, and I think America shows that too. Um, thirdly, uh, you've got no uniformity across the country, and that's probably a very good thing. You can't have your whole continent in, in the same way as Europe doesn't have any um, uniformity, and the United States is exactly what it says. It's United States. It's lots of different states with different conditions, but you do have something that we Europeans should envy. You have a unifying structure of law, you have a unifying structure of overall underpinning, and you have a unifying current, currency. Three things which Europe lacks, which Europe wishes it had, and which Europe doesn't quite yet know how to create. So, so I, I think, please don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Um, and finally, I'd just like to quote uh, what Bloomberg says, that's the mayor of New York, he says, local officials are responsible for doing, not debating. We're having quite a good debate. Um, and then what Joseph Chamberlain says, these were quoted in um, big leader articles about Bruce's work. Uh, cities are like joint stock companies or cooperative enterprises in which every citizen is a shareholder and of which the dividends are receivable in improved health and increase in the comfort and health and happiness of the community. In other words, don't let us forget that it is the collective well-being of people who live in cities and not just cities GDP that shows. And in that, I think Europe has done extremely well and it must be very careful to protect that public and collective realm, as people like Ricky call it, or heritage, and, and, and social structures, I would call it. Finally, I'd just like to tell two naughty stories about Bruce. One is, when we went to uh, Sheffield in 2007 and met all the council officials, he said, oh, if only we had public entrepreneurs like you've got here, which, do you remember? I vaguely remember. <laughs> <laughs> and secondly, when I took him to a dinner with the Sustainable Development Commission, which was much earlier, that was probably, I don't know, about 2002, 2003, he said, these people are off the wall, they're nuts. <laughs> but he became a convert, so I'm very pleased about that. And um, thank you very much. I'm very conscious that some of you can't see what's going on here, so, uh, uh, I'll stand at least to help uh, have the discussion and catch questions in a moment. But Bruce, I mean, there are a number of challenges there. The first, I mean, I, the first thing I'd like to ask, are you surprised by the European, let's call that response to uh, your book? I mean, Anne raises a number of, of points about um, uh, infrastructure, about density, about governance. Um, I mean, you can pick and choose in many ways how which one you want to respond to most. But what surprises you most of what, what Anne is saying? What, what, what would you not get in the States from what you've just heard? Well, you know, the States, um, it's, it's very interesting because, I, and I think, you know, part of the stance of this book is to respond to what is, a, I think, a cultural difference between Europe and the United States, which is, you know, I've, I've tried over the course of my professional career to use, you know, the sort of shock statistics about poverty or neighborhoods of deprivation or, um, you know, growing fiscal and financial challenge. I mean, whatever it is, I've tried to do the laundry list of the challenges, and I have to say it doesn't really work in the United States. The United States, and I would say really across cities and metropolitan areas, across sectors, across disciplines, across party. What the U.S. responds to is the notion that we can crack the code on something. It, it, it really is a problem-solving culture in many respects, and an entrepreneurial culture, and an innovative culture. And so as, as over the course of my career, um, partly influenced by Cisneros, um, you know, partly just really influenced by crowdsourcing <laughs> and spending uh, most of my time outside of Washington, D.C., I've tried to reorient my work and the work of the program uh, to basically help networks of leaders get stuff done. And, and so, I, 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 you know, so this is really partly a cultural difference. Um, you know, the United States is not a may I culture. 
Uh, it's more of an ask forgiveness culture, and actually it's not even ask forgiveness, it's just do stuff and you know, worry about it later. Um, our idea of long-term planning tends to be lunch, you know? So I mean, so I, I, I think, you know, part of this book is really to try uh, to help leaders who do have the wherewithal um, to do things that matter in their places, you know, with the flow of federal resources or private resources, but they, they do have the ability to design and deliver game-changing initiatives and transformative investments. And we're trying to remind them of that power and to set a new standard and to set a new norm and say, guess what, folks? You're not going to be held up as a great leader by subsidizing sports stadia or extending convention centers or by building another perform performing arts facility that no one goes to. You know, you're, you're going to be held up as a great leader by focusing on what really matters to power your place forward. And I, the only thing I would say, because I, you know, I think Ann's comments are, are, are you know, in, in many ways um, um, well placed. Um, but I would say that the level of disruption right now in the United States goes well beyond the political dysfunction. I mean, we are talking about a demographic transformation to a minor, majority minority nation in a relatively short period of time. And frankly, a lot of the reaction that goes on in the United States with the Tea Party is a reaction to that demographic transition. Put on top of that the shale gas revolution. Put on top of that reshoring of production. Put on top of that the potential for a new spatial geography of innovation in our cities and metropolitan. This is a very volatile period. And so what we are really trying to say to these networks of leaders, and we probably can fit them all into one sports stadia, subsidized by some city somewhere, um, and basically said, hey folks, you know, whether it's 50,000 or 60, you're in, okay? You're in to set the direction for our nation right now. Okay, so how do we channel all these disruptive forces, you know, in the service of more inclusive and sustainable and productive and innovative and resilient growth? That's what we're doing. Um, and I, so I, I mean, this is a very conscious, you know, political act, frankly, in addition to being, I think, an evidence-based assessment Let's of where the nation is. Let's just take yeah. two. I mean, there were very many points raised by Anne. Let's just take two and yeah. just go a bit deeper. I mean, Anne is absolutely right to, I think, describe the fu one of the fundamental differences in the American city versus the European city broadly is the extraordinary concentration of, of ghettos, both in terms of ethnic and, and income. You hardly talked about that. Okay? What are you going to do about it? How do you de-ghettoize cities which are so deeply entrenched? That, that didn't come out from what I heard. Now, maybe it's in you know, details of the book. Is that an issue that needs to be addressed? I would say so that's one point. Right. Connected, again, rephrasing something Anne said. In giving up on federal government, I know you're not fully, right. but in, you know, to a degree, giving up on that, are you not losing that framework, that essential sort of ethical framework which uh, allows some of these broader social issues to be addressed, which business by itself can't do. And it can tell us a little bit more about what you were thinking of those two issues which Anne raised. So the biggest spatial poverty trend in the United States is the suburbanization of poverty, which is growing rapidly in the United States. So um, because cities are recovering in part, because we bit, bit the bullet, and tore down the worst public housing in the United States under the Clinton administration um, because the high-rises that we had created in the 50s had become warehouses of the poor and were literally killing children and killing neighborhoods. We have seen a rapid suburbanization of poverty. Suburbs are not lily white. Suburbs are not monolithic. They're not uniform. Frankly, if you want to go to some of the poorest parts of the United States, don't go to a city. Go to an older suburb, which is on the wrong side of the region, without any economic base, without any philanthropy, without any business. And what I think that does is create a new potential political coalition at the metropolitan scale to crack at poverty. So the U.S. of 2013 is not the U.S. of 1975 in terms of where poverty is located, where poverty is growing. And in terms of what the national government does, what the national government principally needs to do 
is to provide a safety net for people. The disadvantaged, the elderly, um, people with disabilities through essentially income transfers or large transfers to institutions, essentially. That's what they need to do. When they actually do try to intervene in areas of poverty, many times they tend to reconcentrate poverty because their method of intervening, and I was in this business for 10 years, is to primarily build affordable housing in the very places where you have poverty concentration as opposed to transform economies or give people greater access to opportunity through skills and education. So, you know, my view of the federal government, frankly, over the past 70 years is they built the highways that disrupted the cities. They built the public housing that destroyed neighborhoods. They basically focused on affordable housing rather than education and skills as a way up the ladder. They did many things that frankly did not really align with common sense. And I fundamentally believe that the people who are closer to the problem are the ones who have better ability to, to basically design and deliver integrated solutions than stovepiped and siloed agencies sitting in a capital far, far away, right? It might as well be a parallel universe or a parallel planet. So I want them to have a safety net. Yes, we also need to defend the homeland, et cetera. I mean, right? I mean, we, we want them to have a safety net. And we want them to invest in that safety net uh, at a level and at a scale so people can be lifted out of poverty. But on many other things that matter to competitiveness or inclusive growth or poverty reduction or social mobility, I don't think the national government, frankly, is wise and into I mean, I've had a radical shift in my thinking over 25 years. I started as an urbanist. I started working for the New York City Council. I then went to Washington, like most people go to Washington, because that's like the city on the hill. So in you know, a way, so we, we have to be pleased that you're not the Secretary of Urban the Housing and Urban Development, which was on the cards. Can I, uh, one, one I thing would have been a little more disruptive. Yeah, <laughs> but you might have not been there. Uh, <laughs> After all. Um, we're going to open up the questions to the floor in, in a moment. But I mean, it is, I've just come back from Rio, where we held right. an Urban Age conference, where this issue of what central government can do uh, in terms of just uh, subsidizing the poor is that over the last, well, less than a decade, 40 million people have moved from below the poverty line to what is considered lower middle class, through, from, from top down through the, that's the, the Bolsa Familia. Uh, sort of, yeah, and that's, that's, that's quite interesting. It doesn't mean that the cities are particularly livable or less ghettoized right. than anything in the States, but actually, in that sense, uh, not far. I have just w one question. It, this came up last night, but I'd like to repeat it because it's behind uh, some of the things Anne has been talking about, um, and you showed that statistic right at the beginning that, I, I, if I'm right, 85% of uh, residents of metros in the States are foreign-born? Yeah. Well, no, the 85% of the foreign-born in the United States live are in living in cities. Metro. Right. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, there are national policies, uh, both in Europe right. and certainly in the United States, which are anti-immigration for reasons that we know. Cities can thrive, do thrive, on immigration. What are you going to do about that? The United States is demographically blessed. I mean, uh, you know, we should all get up in the morning, kiss the ground, and say, thank God for immigrants. Uh, because we are an aging society, but we've brought in people. Some are low-skilled, some are middle-skilled, some are high-skilled, uh, to be the next entrepreneurs and to be the next workforce. And we're going to go from 25% of the American workforce being black and Latino to 40% in a very, very short period of time. So we are not hitting a demographic wall. We are still a growing country. And the narrative of, of the United States, irrespective of the hiccups we have, in Arizona or in Georgia or somewhere else, or irrespective of the inability of our federal government to pass a sane and sensible immigration reform, is we are a nation of immigrants. And, I, and so the Houston Settlement House story is the future of our country. How do we integrate, how do we assimilate immigrants into the economic mainstream? Because that's the next America. And I, I fundamentally believe that yeah, demographic- Wait, give us two sentences. Yeah. What, what actually happens in the Houston? Oh, so it's basically uh, in some of the poorest city and suburban neighborhoods. And I've been to both in Houston, and it's a vast place. Um, thousands of immigrants every year speaking dozens and dozens of different languages have access to English as a second language, 
low-cost banking so they don't have to deal with the predatory bankers, um, charter schools, access to health care, access to skills training. It's a one-stop shop for immigrants. It's a settlement house for the 21st century. It is a large $250 million corporation, essentially, backed by business, many Republican business leaders. Um, the, the person who started the settlement house in 1907, it's now a network, is the grandmother of Jim Baker, who was the chief of staff to President Reagan and the former Treasury Secretary and Foreign Minister, essentially. Okay, so let's, this is, you know, let's open up to the floor. Can I ask you to say who you are uh, and ask a question, not make a statement? That would be helpful. So there's a gentleman here, there, and it would be great to have someone from above. So let's have three in a row, and then Bruce, if you make notes sure. as to what I'm you want to notes. answer, and equally if you Hi, I'm William Chan. I'm a native New Yorker now living in London as a lawyer. I'm looking forward to reading your book because uh, I'm very startled by a couple of your cases that I'm familiar with, one being New York, the other one being Detroit. Yeah. Um, but I'll focus on New York. Like many native New Yorkers, I've seen New York prosper amazingly in the last two decades. So I'm a little surprised that you focus on a mayor that I actually greatly support, but focusing on one of his initiatives that is not even happening yet, I mean, in terms of the, uh, the great engineering school uh, you know, in, on the island when, of course, New York City already has some great universities. I'm an alum of several of them. So I'm wondering whether or not you're just projecting a revolution in a city like New York on a policy that, uh, is it just some, using that as a symbol of our many, many policies and some incredibly favorable demographic changes that have made New York an amazingly great city again? Or are you thinking that, no, a new, because to me, New York City, for instance, is already the number two tech hub in America, which is amazing achievement, taking away from Cambridge and other places. So, so is, is the Technicon thing something that's necessary for the future, or are you you're just using it as a symbol for all the great changes that happened in New York City? Come, come back to that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, microphone over there. No, uh, the, OK. Up there now, second, and then third over there. I, I think you need to speak louder. Not really. It will if you shout. Let's, let's try again. Wait one second. Just tap it, see whether it works. OK, then stand up and shout. I'm Giles Taylor, a business consultant. Um, I agree with what, much of what you're saying about the growth of cities and the power. But I'm particularly interested in the political and economic play out, so to speak, of the suburban and ex-urban areas. I mean, clearly, you're missing a third of the US population, which really is rural and suburban areas. How do they react? How are they going to react to the growth in decision making largely in the cities? Because in some ways, it's, it's actually anti-democratic. And I think it can lead to longer term almost instability in society if it's just being run by big cities and big networks of cities, which ultimately is a part of our population. Thank you. Yes, and the third question. Hi, I'm Hi, I'm Jose Monroy. I'm an urban planner. And I was just wondering, considering the power relationships, do you think the federal government has understood this power the cities have in the US? And on the other hand, if cities may have found a way to lobby the federal government too. OK. So Bruce, if you could take those three, and if I show of hands, if there are other questions, so that I know where to come next. Um, so let, let me talk with, start with the New York City story, uh, because um, obviously what Mayor Bloomberg does, uh, many leaders in the United States listen and follow and observe and then try to replicate. And I, I think we picked that story both for the near term and the long term. So in the near term, Bloomberg put about 130 million down um, through his capital budget to remake Roosevelt Island primarily through infrastructure investments for advanced technology and engineering campus, right? There's two billion on the table already to build out that university. And the projections over a relatively, you know, 20-year period is 
30 billion plus in private investment, 50,000 jobs, 1,000 startups to continue to accelerate the shift of, in diversification in the New York City economy. We, we use the New York City example in part because of the mid-2000s, early part of the last decade, focus on stadium building as the principal way to power a city forward on the route to the Olympics. And, and, and we fundamentally believe that it's this focus on production and innovation um, that for the long haul is going to put New York City in a much, much better stay. So it's both a short-term effect and a long-term effect. And already, frankly, around the United States, it is having this, uh, this impact of mayors and business and civic leaders saying, where should our advanced research universities be located? Should they be out in a nondescript uh, suburban area, which many of them are, or should we begin to take the most advanced bits, put them back into the central cities to have the highest return on investment and the highest job growth? And just to make one point, 40% of the STEM economy uh, is accessible to people with sub-baccalaureate degrees, which means they're either getting technical training in high schools, what we used to call vocational education, or community college, junior college. So this is not just for the brainiacs from Stanford. There's a large portion of this economy that can be staffed with good wages, good benefits. Second part about non-metropolitan America. So all of all the metropolitan areas of the United States are 84% of our population and 91% of our GDP. Um, so we're leaving out 16%. 47 of the 50 states have a majority of their GDP generated by their cities and metropolitan areas. So this is the reality of our country. We are the quintessential metropolitan nation. And yet culturally, we still act as if we're a network of small villages or something. So this is, this is sort of a shot to the political and business and civic elite. Let's act like the nation we truly are. And then within these metropolitan envelopes, let's really work on city, metros, and the rural parts of our metropolitan areas. 50% of people who live in rural counties live in metropolitan areas because the sprawl went on so long. So they're, they're commuting back into the metros. So we're trying to make a point that, A, we're a country dominated by these metros, all metros, and there's a synergistic effect between metro and non-metro America because of energy supply, because of agricultural supply. So we've played the game of dividing America by city and suburb or metro and non-metro. We're really trying to focus on what unites us, essentially. Um, but, but making a very strong assertive case. Um, the last part about the federal government and whether the mayors and the cities have been able to sort of, well, first of all, whether the federal government understands the country in which they live um, and whether cities and metros have been able to lobby, you know, the country with great effect. Um, on the first question, I would say the answer is, for the most part, no. I, I don't think the federal government or many of the elected officials or, frankly, many of the people who staff the agencies in the national government really quite understand the disruptive change happening in our country. Being on the ground really matters because when you're on the ground, it's not just the one effect of a particular agency. It's the cumulative effect. It's the interdisciplinary effect. It's the integrated effect. I mean, there isn't one I mean, the, the whole rise of the midtowns in our cities, the innovation districts off our anchors, there's not one agency in the federal government who's even cognizant of what the hell is going on because it's happening in small business and it's happening in housing and it's happening in R&D and it's happening in commerce and that cuts across seven or ten agencies. It's such a compartmentalized technocracy. It can't quite connect to the organic way in which our country operates. And secondly, for the mayors and the county leaders, um, you know, frankly, I, I think they're, they've learned their lesson over time. Let's have the national government do the big stuff well. Let's have them fund the social safety net. Let's have them invest in basic science, particularly around health and defense. We can do a lot of the rest off our own balance sheets and off of public-private finance. I was at a yeah. conference this morning with Benjamin Barber, who's written yeah. extensively about the power of the mayor 
a new book, uh, Mayors Will Rule the World, and he was very much sort of um, pushing this. And I'm interested, you know, Anne in a way was saying, well, it does depend whether the mayor is any good or bad. Just a quick, quick uh, sort of response. Are uh, American metro mayors getting better? I'm I, not going to jail. And I, and I, well, you know, um, there are a lot of good mayors who went to jail, so I don't. <laughs> 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 um, uh, uh, you know, uh, so we could have a, a sidebar conversation about that. <laughs> okay. um, in the 1890s, we call that honest graft. No. Um, <laughs> here's the most daily senior comes. No, to here's the most important thing. <clears throat> Cities are networks. They're not governments. It's wonderful to have a charismatic mayor like Rahm Emanuel in Chicago. It's wonderful to have a visionary mayor, frankly, by, like Michael Bloomberg in New York City. But what's more important from my perspective is having solid people at the heads and in the middle tier of your universities and your major corporations and your business chambers and your labor unions and go on and on. It's interesting, because, Anne, you, you were quite critical a moment ago of, of um, this notion that they're networks. No, I just said don't discount, oh, sorry. No, uh, in fact, uh, when talking to my students sometimes about how you can describe what a city is, I remember coming up with the idea of a washing up bowl with loads and loads of corks out of yeah. bottles floating on the top. So many corks that they won't all fit. And you just touch the edge of the bowl and all the corks all shift around. So actually, we're not at all far apart on that. But I was just trying to say that in Europe, at least, city governments and national governments, and actually international governments, I think are really, really crucial. I don't think, I don't think businesses would think they could manage without governments, and maybe you think that anyway, so, well, and, you, and government you, is just bigger here, it just is, and so obviously, it no, I mean, as, I mean, look, it's all a public-private partnership of some kind. I exactly. Mean, and, I mean, when we see the build-out of these midtowns, you know, uh, private civic finance, uh, land use and zoning, which is obviously a, in the public realm, smart education and skills moves, right, so that we can actually begin to get back to having our schools uh, be school to work rather than teach to test. I mean, so the city, the public realm, public goods really matter. Public responsibilities yeah, really matter. No. But we're not waiting for the public sector to do it. You know, Let's have a couple of questions. I think the young lady over there with the stripy sweater, and then gentleman over there. Hi, um, Jessica Firm from UCL. I'm an urban planner. Um, I just wanted to see if we could turn the discussion to London, because I'd be interested in both your views and Anne's. Um, obviously here we're, you know, we have a very, very strong financial centre, very strong financial and business services, very strong creative sector, um, but a regional level of governance that doesn't seem to acknowledge the importance of manufacturing yeah. at that level. Um, and just wondering what sort of revolution we might need in London and how we might get there. Thank you. Over there, right at the back. Can you take the microphone? Back row. Tell us who you are, please. Hi. Uh, I'm Alex. I'm an MSc student here at LSE. Um, obviously, I'm from America. So As close um, as possible, because we can't hear, put it closer. No? OK. Uh, I'm an MSc student here at LSE, and I'm from America and stuff. Um, a lot of your stories are talking about, like, you know, coming out of a crisis and, you know, almost like the first growth after uh, a forest fire. Uh, but for a city, like I'm from Minneapolis where everything, you know, they say everybody is above average <laughs> and it's just kind of on, a, you know, on a steady path. How do those types of cities that haven't had this kind of crisis jump onto this metropolitan revolution? Okay, okay. Nikki, short. Please, though. Wait, 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 wait for the microphone. Wait for the microphone. Wait, 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 the microphone. Nikki Gavron. Sorry, I'm a London wide assembly member. And, um, uh, yeah, well, never mind the rest. Um, I, I wanted to say that um, I have been to Portland a couple of times, twice, and I know quite a lot about Portland. And the continuity of leadership there, well, of policy, taken up by a whole, you know, over four decades, has been extremely important. And I'm, I'm very with you on lots of things, Bruce, but I, and hi, <laughs> and good for all you've done, but I, I do 
I do worry very much about you dismissing the role of government and, the ro and how much it could set the enabling, the vision, the enabling framework for exactly what you're talking about in the networks. And uh, there has to be some regulation which helps shape markets. These things don't happen accidentally. Thank you. Bruce, three minutes to answer three questions, and then I'll, Anne, you may want to have some final um, So, I, again, I, I, again I, I really appreciate what, what Nick is saying here, and I fundamentally agree. In a place like Portland or in Indianapolis or in Denver, there really has been a continuity of leadership. But I have to say, in a lot of cities and metropolitan areas, there isn't that kind of visionary leadership, and therefore we're sending a very sharp signal to corporate, civic, philanthropic, university leadership, you need to step up here. You, you can't wait for the charismatic mayor or the intelligent mayor, the smart mayor, because you're going to lose 10 years. Pittsburgh just lost 10 years because they elected a 25-year-old to be their mayor. Um, and the guy, he was completely clueless. So, I, you know, I, I mean, you've got to basically take responsibility for your city, not just if you're elected, or not waiting for the electeds, but across the network. Minneapolis, St. Paul, look, here's the, because we do a lot of work with them, and they're quiet, right? They're, they're not sort of blowing their own horn, and they've had great leadership. Mayor Ryback in Minneapolis, Mayor Coleman in St. Paul, they've had metropolitan mayor's uh, efforts, they've got fiscal disparities laws. The question really, and for many cities and metropolitan areas, are you a first mover or are you a fast follower, right? And that, that's really the question whether you're talking about infrastructure or innovation or skills, I find the Minneapolis folks to be some of the most, the smartest and most intelligent folks we deal with. And they're always looking at everyone else and saying, that's really smart. Let's do that. Let's do it better. Right? But then they don't blow their own horn. Awesome. In fact, London calling. Um, devolve more, but don't underestimate the assets and advantages of many of your core cities in the north. Um, the con you know, this conversation in England at times is just so bizarre, I mean, frankly, I mean, you know, I mean, between the London powerhouse and everyone else, I mean, you've got some great core cities in this country that really need to leverage their assets. I'm a big believer in this country of high-speed rail to really connect up and integrate, you know, Manchester and so forth, uh, you know, to the London powerhouse, but devolve more. I mean, Whitehall has way too much power in this country. And a really, so much of it belongs down at the city and metropolitan. And final comments, Anne. If I could just quickly say that there's so much about London. I mean, I live in London. I've lived in London all my adult life, and it's a very enviable and it's a brilliantly friendly and integrated and close together city. It's also hugely divided, but it's not enviable to the rest of the country because it's too expensive. It's too crowded. It's almost unmanageable. It's too rich, it's very unequal. And so actually up north, we're very proud. And it's different up north. So, so that is one of our big things. And I think we just need to keep pushing that message. So, so that's that little bit dealt with. But on sort of roundup, I'd been about to say, well, Pittsburgh really broke ground in America because it had such a poor government and such a huge industrial collapse that its businesses did get together Absolutely. ahead of the game. Absolutely. So when we were doing our European Phoenix cities, Pittsburgh was one of the models that Bruce told us to look at. And, and they pulled ahead partly because of their business university partnership. So, so it was very impressive. I'd just like to quickly end by saying, first of all, Bruce's comments on the post-industrial euphoria about the knowledge economy, the chattering classes, was well overplayed and what we ended up with in Phoenix cities was saying actually there will have to be a third level industrial revolution of advanced manufacture, green innovation and all the things that Bruce has been talking about so, so that's very interesting. Uh, secondly, I was very interested that his North, Northern Ohio SME network was about advanced manufacturing, exactly what we've just been today discussing about Sheffield. <coughs> Um, I really like this idea, do good and do well, which is a very Quaker idea. You come to America and you do good and you do well. Um, on the other hand, when you do well on the back of other people, it's not so good. So I just think we all have to remember that doing good on the back of other people isn't really doing well. Um, finally, this game changer idea is very interesting because in our European cities, 
uh, which predates all of this work, um, we talked about turning points, which I think Bruce probably thought was deeply boring. Um, and so his is a game changer. But actually, the idea that you've been pointed in one direction and mm. it's all gone wrong and you shift right. is absolutely crucial. Um. Finally, I'd just like to say that the most inspiring thing for me personally about this book was the Houston neighborhood settlements, which won't surprise Bruce altogether, but it was stunning because these neighborhood settlements were everything. They were enterprise, they were education, they were skills, they were jobs. And I hope everybody heard what Bruce said about jobs, that actually lower to medium skilled jobs are hugely important in the future growth of cities. It is not only about the top jobs. It's about the middle and the lower levels. OK. Of and and uh, Bruce, I want to stop it there so we have the time to do the most important thing as far as you're all concerned, which is to buy a copy of the book outside and then come back and get Bruce to sign it here, because that's what's going to happen. Uh, I, I've been struggling with excitement at this idea of who's a first mover and who's a fast follower. With these two guys, I don't know who's whom, but thank them both. <laughs> thank you very much.